The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth Chapter 1 I was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, on the 26th of April, 1798. My father's family consisted of thirteen children, seven sons and six daughters. I was the third child, having one sister and one brother older than myself. My father had been an officer in the Revolutionary War, and had held a major's commission. He served throughout that glorious struggle, which raised the dignity of man and taught him to be free. I well recollect, when a small boy, the frequent meetings of the old patriots at my father's house, who would sit down and relate the different battles in which they had taken part during those days that tried men's souls. According to the custom of those days, their meetings were occasionally enlivened with some good old peach brandy, the same kind, I presume, as that which the old Tory treated MacDonald when he delivered his splendid charger Salim to him for presentation to Colonel Tarleton which circumstance was frequently spoken of by old soldiers. Often during these reminiscences, every eye would dim, and tears coursed down the cheeks of those old veterans, as they thus fought their battles over again, and recalled their sufferings during the struggles they had passed through. My youthful mind was vividly impressed with the stirring scenes depicted by those old soldiers, but time and subsequent hardship have obliterated most of their narratives from my memory. One incident I recollect, however, related by my father when he formed one of a storming party in the attack on Stony Point made under General Wayne. When I was but about seven or eight years of age, my father removed to St. Louis, Missouri, taking with him all his family and 22 Negroes. He selected a section of land between the forks of the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers, 12 miles below St. Charles, which is to this day known as Beckworth Settlement. At this early period of our history, 1805 to 6, the whole region of the country around was a howling wilderness, inhabited only by wild beasts and merciless savages. St. Louis at that time was but a small town, its inhabitants consisting almost wholly of French and Spanish settlers, who were engaged in trafficking with the Indians the commodities of civilization, such as fire water, beads, blankets, arms, ammunition, etc., for peltry. For protection against the Indians, who were at the time very troublesome and treacherous, it became necessary for the whites to construct blockhouses at convenient distances. These blockhouses were built by the united exertions of settlers, who began to gather from all quarters since the Jefferson Purchase had been effected from the French government. The settlers or inhabitants of four adjoining sections would unite and build a blockhouse in the centre of their possessions, so that in the case of alarm they could all repair to it as a place of refuge from the savages. It was necessary to keep a constant guard on the plantations, and while one portion of the men were at work, the others, with their arms, were on the alert watching the wily Indian. Those days are still fresh in my memory, and it was then that I received, young as I was, the rudiments of my knowledge of the Indian character, which has been of such inestimable value to me in my subsequent adventures among them. There were constant alarms in the neighbourhood of some of the blockhouses, and hardly a day passed without the inhabitants being compelled to seek them for protection. As an illustration of our mode of life, I will relate an incident that befell me when about nine years old. One day my father called me to him and inquired of me whether I thought myself man enough to carry a sack of corn to the mill. 
The idea of riding a horse and visiting town possessed attractions which I could not resist, and I replied with a hearty affirmative. A sack of corn was accordingly deposited on the back of a gentle horse selected for the purpose, and young Jim, as I was called, was placed upon the sack and started for the mill two miles distant. About midway to the mill lived a neighbour having a large family of children, with whom I frequently joined in boyish sports. On my way I rode joyously up to the little fence which separated the house from the road, thinking to pass a word with my little playmates. What was my horror at discovering all the children, eight in number, from one to fourteen years of age, lying in various positions on the dooryard with their throats cut, their scalps torn off, and the warm life blood still oozing from their gaping wounds. In the doorway they lay their father, and near them their mother, in the same condition. They had all shared the same fate. I, find myself, I found myself soon back at my father's house, Without the sack of corn, how I managed to get off, I never discovered, and related the circumstance to my father. He immediately gave the alarm throughout the settlement, and a body of men started in pursuit of the savages who had perpetrated this fearful tragedy. My father, with ten of his own men, accompanying them. In two days the band returned, bringing with them eighteen Indian scalps for the backwoodsmen fought the savage in Indian style, and it was scalp for scalp between them. The day when I beheld the harrowing spectacle of my little murdered playmates is still f as fresh in my memory as at the time of its occurrence, and it never will fade from my mind. It was the first scene of Indian cruelty my young eyes had ever witnessed and I wondered how even savages could possess such relentless minds as to wish to bathe their hands in the blood of little innocents, against whom they could have no cause of quarrel. But my subsequent experience has better acquainted me with the Indian character, as the reader will learn in the course of the following pages. I also recollect a large body of Indians assembling in their war costume on the opposite side of the Mississippi River, in what is now the state of Illinois. This was at Portage de Sioux, 25 miles above St. Louis, and about two miles from my father's house. And their intention was to cut off all the white inhabitants of the surrounding country. The alarm was given, a large party of the settlers collected, crossed the river, and after a severe engagement defeated the Indians with great loss and frustrated their bloody purposes. Three days after this battle, a woman came into the settlement who had been three years captive among the Indians. She had made her escape during the confusion attending their defeat, and reached her friends in safety, after they had long supposed her dead. The name of this woman I do not remember but I have no doubt there are old settlers in that region who yet recollect the circumstance and the general rejoicing with which her escape was celebrated. The news that she brought was of the most alarming nature. She related how several of the Indian tribes had held a grand council and resolved upon a general attack upon St. Louis and all of the surrounding country with the view to butcher indiscriminately all the white inhabitants, French and Spanish excepted. This intelligence produced the greatest alarm among the, in the inhabitants, and every preparation was made to repel the attack. New blockhouses were erected, old ones repaired, and everything placed in the best posture for defence. The Indians soon after appeared in great force opposite St. Louis. Blondo and Interpreter was dispatched across the river to them to inform them of the preparations made for their reception. He informed them of the intelligence communicated by the woman fugitive of, from their camp and represented to them that the people of St. Louis were provided with numerous big guns mounted on wagons, which, in case of attack, 
could not fail to annihilate all of their warriors. They credited Bondo's tale and withdrew their forces. At the period of which I speak, the major part of the inhabitants of St. Louis were French and Spanish. These were on friendly terms with all the Indian tribes and wished to confine their long-established traffic with the Red Man to themselves. For this reason they discountenanced the settlement of Americans among them, as they considered it an invasion of their monopoly of the traffic with Indians, and St. Louis being the grand trading depot for the regions of the West and Northwest, the profits derived from the intercourse were immense. The Indians too, thinking themselves better dealt with by the French and Spanish, united with the latter in their hostility to the influx of the Americans. When about ten years of age I was sent to St. Louis to attend school, where I continued until the year 1812. I was then apprenticed to a man in St. Louis named George Kastner to learn the trade of blacksmith. This man had a partner named John L. Sutton, who is yet a resident in St. Louis. I took to the trade with some unwillingness at first, but becoming reconciled to it, I was soon much pleased with my occupation. When I had attained my nineteenth year, my sense of importance had considerably expanded, and like many others of my age, I felt myself already quite man. Among other indiscretions, I became enamoured of a young da damsel, which, leading me into habits that my boss disapproved of, resulted finally in difficulty between us. Being frequently tempted to transgress my boss's rules by staying from home somewhat late of an evening, and finding the company I spent my time with so irresistibly attractive that I could not bring myself to obedience to orders, I gave way to my passion and felt indifferent whether my proceedings gave satisfaction or otherwise. One morning I was assailed by my principle in language which I considered unduly harsh and insulting, and on this threatening to dismiss me his house, I was tempted to reply with some warmth and acknowledge that his doing so would exactly square with my wishes. Provoked at this, he seized a hammer and flung it at me. I dodged the missile and threw it back at him in return. A scuffle then ensued, in which I, being young and athletic, came off master of the ground, and accepting his polite dismissal, walked straight to my boarding house. But a few moments elapsed before my assailant walked in and forbade my landlady to entertain me farther on his account. I replied I had plenty of money and was competent to pay my own board. This provoked him to a second account, attack, in which he again came off worsened. Hereupon resolving to leave the house, I began to prepare for my departure, but before I had completed my preparations, a one-armed constable presented himself at the stairs and demanded to see me. While knowing his errand, I took a well-loaded pistol in my hand and went to meet him, assuring him that if he ascended the steps to capture me, I would shoot him dead. In my exasperated state of mind, I really believe I should have executed my threat. The constable, perceiving, perceiving my resolute bearing, after parleying a while, went away. Feeling confident that he had gone for another officer, who I feared might capture me, I expedited my departure, and taking refuge in the house of a friend, concealed myself for three days, and then shipped on board a keelboat, proceeding to the mines on Feather River. But I was discovered by my boss and detained, he holding himself responsible for my appearance until my father's decision was learned. Accordingly, I went home to my father and related the difficulty I had recently had with my master. He counselled me to return to my apprenticeship, but I declared my determination never to be reconciled again. My father then wished me to set up in business in his settlement, but I expressed disinclination and declared a growing wish to travel. Seeing my determination, my father finally consented to my departure. 
He admonished me with some wholesome precepts, gave me five hundred dollars in cash, together with a good horse, saddle, and bridle, and bade me Godspeed upon my journey. Bidding adieu to all my friends, I proceeded to the boat and went on board. The object for which the boat was dispatched up the Feather River was to make a treaty with the Sac Indians to gain their consent to working the mines at that time in their possession. The expedition was strictly on a pacific character and was led by Colonel R. M. Johnson. A brother of the colonels accompanied us and several other gentlemen went in the boat as passengers.